Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Children's Cardiomyopathy Foundation's webinar, Exercise, Sports, and Cardiac Rehabilitation. My name is Gina Petty, and I am the Executive Director of the Children's Cardiomyopathy Foundation. The Children's Cardiomyopathy Foundation, or CCF, is a nonprofit organization dedicated to finding causes and cures for pediatric cardiomyopathy through the support of research, education, awareness, and advocacy. Established in 2002, CCF has grown into a global community of families, physicians, and scientists focused on improving diagnosis, treatment, and quality of life for children with cardiomyopathy. Your questions are encouraged during the presentation. You can submit your questions via the question box located on your control panel. We will reserve the last uh, several minutes of the presentation for your questions. You can submit your questions at any time uh, during the talk, and then we will review them at the conclusion of the presentation. This webinar is being recorded and will be available on our CCF website in the coming days. Today, we are thrilled to be joined by Dr. Jonathan Edelson. Dr. Edelson is a cardiologist in the Division of Cardiology at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, the medical director of the Sports Cardiology Program, and senior fellow in the Leonard Davis Institute of Health Economics. He is a pediatric cardiologist with a clinical focus on heart failure, transplant, mechanical circulatory support, and exercise physiology. He believes that it is possible to identify physical activities that are safe and effective for children, and that doing so will ultimately improve the lives of children living with a wide range of cardiac diseases. Dr. Edelson, it's so great to have you with us today. Thank you and welcome. Thank you very much for having me. Uh, I really appreciate it. Um, all right, let's see if I can share my slides properly. It should be the hardest part of the talk. <laughs> okay, we're all set. Yep. Thank you. Um, so thank you very much for the, the generous introduction. And uh, I really want to thank you very much for having me today. Um, you know, this is uh, something that I, I care a lot about. Uh, it's a pleasure to get to speak speak about it with everybody who's here. Um, and, the, you know, the, the Children's Cardiomyopathy Foundation, I think, is a really wonderful organization that's done a tremendous amount of good for the kids that we take care of. Um, and so being able to partner uh, with all of you is a, is a real pleasure and privilege. Um, to give you a bit of a sense of what I'm, I'm hoping to talk about today, we'll start a little bit about the background and rationale. So why even have this discussion? Uh, we'll move on to talk about guidelines uh, to let you know what is out there before going on to my general practice. And I think a way that we can approach uh, activity and exercise and the children that we care for. And then finally, I want to conclude with a, a little bit of an overview of cardiac rehabilitation, um, in part because I think that that's something that many are not familiar with in the pediatric context and is a, a really interesting and, and promising uh, area. And then I'm going to make sure that I stop with enough time to answer questions, because part of, I think, the, the most useful aspect of a session like this is, is really hearing from everybody there. And um, if if uh, folks don't have an opportunity to get their, their questions on the board or answered, I'll make sure that my email is up uh, and so you have an opportunity to, to contact me at, at another time to talk further. Um, so before I talk about any of the data or any of the projects that we've worked on, I just want to give you a little bit of a sense of who I am. So you heard about the fact that I'm a, a cardiologist, which is true. Um, um, and I have a background in cardiomyopathy and exercise physiology and a, a master's in clinical epidemiology. But I think uh, just as importantly, I'm a, I'm a parent. Um, before I went into medicine, I, I worked as a teacher uh, in both middle school and up to the college level. And then I've also been a coach um, of my kids' teams and of other kids' teams, and, um, and at least still consider myself an athlete, although uh, my wife has seen this slide and thinks that I should put former there. And, and honestly, you know, I, I think that those four bullet points on the bottom half of the screen are, are at least as important uh, to how I approach caring for children as the, as the top three points, which is why I bring them up. So just starting uh, with where we've been, um, I think many of you know that in general, the practice of, of exercise in children with cardiomyopathy was one of significant restriction. There was a lot of concern that allowing children to be active would place them at, at undue risk for a cardiac event, and that might actually precipitate a worsening of their cardiomyopathy. 
And I put this sort of colorful drawing on the right hand side of the screen as a reminder. Um, when I was a medical student, I was I was shadowing a, a heart failure cardiologist. Um, and we went into the room to see a 12-year-old who'd been recently diagnosed with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And I remember we went into the room and the cardiologist said to the kid, it's time for you to start playing the violin. Uh, and this was pretty heartbreaking as it would have been for me when I was 12 and really, uh, really resonated. Um, you know, uh, and so I, I sort of carry that lesson with me as I move forward in my career. I, you know, I think that the, the restriction that we've placed on children with cardiomyopathy um, is not without a cost. So we know that kids who have cardiomyopathy do not perform as well when they exercise as children with typical hearts. So this is a study from, from our institution of children that we follow who have hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And what I want you to see is that, you know, their cardiorespiratory fitness is, is not as good as it is with children who have typical hearts. So about 80% are predicted. And maybe even more worrying, what you can see in the figure on the right, is that there's accumulation of those deficits over time. So their fitness gets worse and worse and worse as they get older. And a lot of that is, is product of restriction. And with that impaired exercise tolerance, we also see that there's an increased accumulation of cardiovascular risk factors. So this is a really nice study that Jen Conway's group uh, is doing in, in children, actually mostly in Canada. But what she showed is that more than half of her patients were overweight or obese. Uh, nearly a third of patients who had hypertrophic cardiomyopathy had elevated cholesterol levels. And 11% of kids, and these are kids, remember, were hypertensive. Um, and that's a real problem. You know, you're, you're taking kids who have inherent cardiovascular risk factors that are immutable, that we really can't change. And by restricting them, uh, we've added on these, these accumulated cardiovascular risk factors. And so that's a real worry. But the, you know, the cost is not just physical. Um, so I think everybody knows that there's tremendous mental health benefit for exercise. And I think that this may have even increased importance with children with cardiomyopathy, because we know that this is a population that has got higher rates of anxiety, higher rates of depression, and has decreased quality of life in comparison to, to their peers. And then, as I, I've mentioned, we know that children who participate in organized sports have improvement in depressive symptoms. You know, I, I would just ask everybody in the, you know, in the group today to think about how they feel differently if they were able to exercise in a given day. And then if you think back to your childhood and for, for patients you may be on now, like just think about how important it was from a social perspective, from a developmental perspective to be a part of a team. Um, and so I think we are increasingly understanding the cost that comes from, from eliminating these opportunities for the kids we take care of. That said, I, I don't want people to think that things are bleak. Um, this is, you know, a, a figure that high that hangs in our office and is something that I look to often because I think there is always hope. And I think particularly in this field, there's a tremendous uh, of reasons to be optimistic. You know, in part, it's because things are changing. OK, in part, we know that the risk is not nearly as high as we previously believed. So more and more studies are coming out about children who have HCM and showing that actually they're more likely to have cardiac events when they're at rest or, it's, or when they're sleeping, not when they're doing sports. And similarly, children who have dilated cardiomyopathy, particularly when they're asymptomatic, can exercise without increasing the risk of events. And with the exception of certain types of arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathies, there's really no data at all that exercising worsens disease progression. At the same time, I think as a, as a field of pediatrics, we're really recognizing how critical exercise is in children. So one in three children in the United States is obese and suicide, this is terrible, but accounts for over 10% of deaths in our young adults. So one of the things that I think is really critical that we understand as cardiologists is that children who have cardiomyopathy are not spared from the diseases of childhood. In fact, given their inherent cardiovascular risk factors, they may be at increased risk for the negative effects of, of the additive components that come with not exercising. So what do the guidelines say? Well, again, things have shifted over time. The most recent guidelines put out by the HA and the ACC 2020 stated that the beneficial effects of exercise on general health can be expended to patients with HGM. Remember, this is put out for adults, but can largely be extrapolated for many pediatric patients. They contend that healthy recreational exercise is not associated with increased risk. 
And similarly, for children with dilated cardiomyopathy, an ejection fraction of over 40 can engage in sports as long as they don't have symptoms or any concerning findings on their workup. I do want to say a brief, uh, a brief mention about um, children who are gene positive. So, you know, we have, have, as we've developed advances in genetic testing and lowered the cost of doing so, genetic screening has increased. Um, and I think that there's tremendous value in doing that. Uh, but we've also developed a whole new population of children and adults who are what I would call genotype positive, phenotype negative. So these are the kids, right, who maybe they have a mother or a father who has hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and had a gene identified. And so the children come in for screening. They may have a normal echo, a normal EKG, but they'll test positive for that same gene. So they don't show any evidence of having changes in their heart muscle, but they have a gene which we know could predispose them to changes. Um, what I wanna point out here is for those children, there is no indication for restriction at all. There's no evidence that they are at any increased risk of having a cardiac event in comparison to any other child who has no evidence of disease. Obviously, they should continue to see a cardiologist. They should be evaluated to see whether they ultimately come phenotype positive, but there's no reason to, to, to restrict them. To a certain degree on the other side of the spectrum are children who have ICDs in place, either because of a prior event or because of a risk of event. Um, you know. These are kids and young adults who certainly can participate in sports. I think the, the risk profile and evaluation is a little bit different in part because you have to think about danger to the device. So direct trauma can obviously harm the device or cause the leads to break. And I think it's also important that we recognize that these devices are not foolproof. So particularly in the setting of um, exercise, um, there can be inappropriate shocks or, or failure to shock. And then finally, you know, I wanted to put this point because I've had more and more teenage patients who have been restricted asking, well, can I get an ICD then? If my cardiologist is worried I'm going to have an animal rhythm, can I just have an ICD and go back to playing? And what I want to point out is that, you know, putting an ICD in is it, in order for somebody to play is considered to have more risk than benefit, more harm than good. And in part, that's just because an ICD is not without a psychological burden. The worry about inappropriate shock is high, and we really should not and are not putting in ICDs just to allow patients to play. So in this shifting context of understanding the benefits of exercise and, and thinking about um, whether some of our risk was overestimated, you know, I, I started to wonder what determines whether a patient with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy turns out like this man. So this is this is uh, Jared Butler. So he he won an NCAA championship when he played for Baylor, um, and then most recently played for the Utah Jazz. Um, you know, versus somebody who is not active and not athletic. And I you know I think you know disease severity certainly makes a difference here. So, you know, in, in large studies of competitive and professional athletes who have hypertrophic cardiomyopathy versus those um, who have hypertrophic cardiomyopathy but are not competitive athletes, we know that you're more likely to be a competitive athlete if your heart is not as thick. We know that people on beta blockers have impaired exercise capacity. And we know that, that people are more likely to be competitive athletes if they have less fibrosis on MRI, if they're less obstructed. Um, or if they're free of a family history of sudden cardiac death or hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. But one of the things that I've, I've learned in taking care of these kids and their families is that disease severity, well, very important. And I intentionally tried to choose an iceberg here that wasn't just a little tip, um, but is not the entire story. So patients and their thoughts and worries play a role here. Parents and their concerns play a role here. Coaches play a role. Schools play a role. And we play a role too as the provider. And I, I think this slide is actually very important because I think that you know, the future of our field and hopefully the present is developing interventions which allow children to participate in sports that are safe for them and activities that are safe for them. But if all we focus on is disease severity and we, fa we fail to take into account all of these other critical players, then we're not gonna be effective in doing this. And I'll give you a little bit of an example of a personal lesson. Um, so, you know, um, armed with sort of the, the enthusiasm of some of the work in adults and the changing guidelines, uh, we put together a pilot study of activity in hypertrophic patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. These are all uh, 
teenagers um, and we paired them up with an exercise physiologist to do a 16 week home exercise program. A combination of strength and aerobic training at home. We gave them a Fitbit to help titrate to a goal heart rate. Um, and we did check-ins to see how they were doing, whether they're having any symptoms um, and observe their process. And you know what I wanna show you is just the um, ability to participate of the first seven, seven uh, participants in this study. So this is a, a pretty simple figure, but what I really wanted to highlight is how different the amount of participation was, right? So if you look at subject three or four, they went to hardly any sessions. Over those 16 weeks, less than a handful. And then if you look at subject one, over 16 weeks, he went to every single session, showed up every single time. And I think that, you know, um, if you had showed me this slide three years ago, I might have expected that subject one would be the one with the most benign form of disease of all the kids in the cohort. You know, the one whose, whose heart looked pretty close to normal. Um, and subjects three and four were the kids who were sicker. This was not the case. So subject one, who had 100% adherence, went to every session, he actually had the thickest heart of any subject. And he's the one who's probably had the most difficult clinical course. Uh, so he most recently had a myectomy because he was so thick and symptomatic. And at first, this really blew my mind. I'm trying to sort out, you know, why is this kid who, if anything, has the, the most disease severity, why is he the one who is the most active of the group? And so I went back and talked to the kids to get a sense of what are the things that allow them to play and what are the things that hold them back? And we learned some really interesting stuff. So what motivates kids? Well, parents who are involved, my mom told me to. Um, you know, when exercising was a way that they can participate and be more included with their friends, then that was a real incentive. And then this bottom bullet, I think, is, is a really interesting thing. So we found that for certain kids, uh, they were able to articulate that exercise and activity was a way in which that they could take control over their life and control over their health. This allowed them to get better. This was a way that they could control their disease. What got in the way? Well, kids were worried. They didn't want to do something that hurt themselves or caused them to have uh, a starting cardiac event. So when their watch buzzed to tell them their heart rate was getting too high, they just stopped entirely. Others had technical difficulties they couldn't access the equipment or they just didn't have the time, right? Our, our kids are really busy, even those who don't play sports. There's a ton of homework. There's all kinds of extracurricular activities and some of them just didn't have time to exercise. And these things have come out in other studies too, of children with cardiomyopathy. So, you know, we found that it's easier to be healthy when you have a family that encourages health and where health is role modeled. And I think this is a really important point. You know, I think families that are active together are more active. Um, this idea of autonomy, so helping our kids understand that this is a way to take control over their health, control over their future. The third point I think is really interesting as well. So for certain kids, I found that being partially restrictive makes them not want to participate at all. Um, so, you know, I had a, um, a kid who, um, for a variety of reasons, uh, felt like it was safe for him to to play on his on his high school football team. But some of the weightlifting that they were doing in the the all season seemed not in his best interest and we felt wasn't a safe decision for him. And for him, honestly, the need to tell his coaches or his peers, his co-athletes that he would be different from them and that he couldn't do all the lifting that they were doing was enough for him to say he'd rather not play. So we have to come up with ways in which um, exercise recommendations don't feel overly prescriptive to our kids. And I'll get into that during the second half of this talk. And then I thought this last point was really interesting too. So we put a lot of trust in our doctors on what they tell us really matters. And if we feel safe exercising based on what they say, we're more likely to do it. So I took a look around and you know, it's true that what we say seems to matter and what we say is really different. So this was a study, these were all pediatric cardiologists who had advanced training in the care of children with cardiomyopathy. And they gave them a very simple clinical vignette. This is a 17 year, year old young man. He has no symptoms. He's certainly on the thicker side, but not extraordinarily thick. And he's not particularly obstructed. The family history is relatively benign. And they said, what would your exercise recommendations be for this child? And 
Just take a look at the variation that you see here. There wasn't even a majority opinion. And in fact, there were just as many doctors who said they would let this child exercise, do whatever they wanted, as there were doctors who said that they would be extremely restrictive of the same child. And you know, this I think um, is a real problem uh, because we need to do better. It, it seems um, really, really unfair to me that a child would receive different advice and honestly have a, an entirely different childhood just based on the office that they walk into. And so they, as a field, we're starting to recognize this and we're understanding that we need to communicate more and we need to come up with evidence-based guidelines that we use to inform the care of all of our children. And I'm, you know, I'm really excited to say that, you know, uh, working on uh, the updated guidelines for ISHLT, heart failure recommendations and cardiomyopathy recommendations. And there's a lot more in there about, about exercise, about lifestyle modification. And I'm hopeful that those improved and increased guidelines are going to eliminate some of this heterogeneity and variability, which I think is really not fair to the kids that we take care of. So shifting a little bit to give you a sense of what my approach has been um, to taking care of kids with cardiomyopathy and how it is that I approach exercise. Now, you know, I, I want to just sort of have a few caveats here. Obviously, every child is different. Um, I can't tell you exactly what will apply to you or what would apply to your child. Um, and that this is a work in progress. So my approach has changed during my early career. I'm sure it's going to continue to change over the next several years and hopefully get better. But my general orientation is this, is that there is a safe and effective form of exercise for every child. Um, and I really try and start from a place of positivity. So rather than beginning with the things that we can't do, let's start with the things that we can do. I think a few general guidelines for dealing with exercise and activity. You have to find something that you enjoy, all right? So nobody is going to do exercise or activity that they don't like or they, they don't get something out of. And, you know, I, everybody should reflect on their own experience, right? I don't know how many people have tried a new program of running or biking or weightlifting, but those are not the things that you stick with if you don't like them. I think it's also important to have a really expanded understanding of what activity means, right? There are some kids who want to play on the school soccer team, but there are plenty of other kids who like to do other things that are active. So I had a, 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 a teenage patient of mine and she loved the outdoors. Um, and so ultimately what she got really into was hiking. So her and her family, every weekend, they would look up a different cool place to hike in Pennsylvania. And she got better and better and more and more conditioned and more and more into it. And she found a network of other friends to hike with. And then she got more into leading backpacking trips and she got into great shape. And that wasn't playing sports. There's, there's dance, there's gymnastics. And then there's also like the day-to-day -day stuff. So if you have a dog, putting a target of giving a 30-minute or 45-minute or even a 60-minute walk for the dog. Um, is a great goal and something that's probably good for the dog too. I think the next piece, and we'll talk a little bit more about this too, is, is it's really critical to find your purpose. So when I meet with kids in clinic, I talk to them about why it is that they want to exercise. And sometimes it takes a little while to help them get to what their real goal is. So sometimes they want to make the JV team. I, I'll tell you, it was really interesting and to a certain degree, like surprising how many kids um, are exercising because they want to feel better in their clothes. They want to feel more confident when they walk down the hallway in high school. They want to look good on the beach this summer. And, I, you know, I don't think that there's anything wrong with that. I think that, you know, I, I like to feel confident too when I walk into a room. I like to feel good in my clothes, as I'm sure many of you do too. And I think that there's certainly a healthy and positive way that we can endorse being active uh, and feeling more confident. Others set more concrete, finite goals. They want to be able to finish a 5K. They want to be able to complete going for a run with their mom without getting out of breath. Um, and I think harnessing to an exercise related goal is, is really critical in, in, in being active. And then, as I sort of alluded to before, think about a way to make this a family activity. So we know, right, that patients who, who um, participate in sports or activity or outside time with their family are more likely to stick with it and more likely to get what they want out of it. So, you know, I, I want to walk a little bit more into how I go about evaluating risk and evaluating what's the appropriate exercises for a kid, just so you can get a sense of what it is that I'm thinking and what other cardiologists are thinking. So one is I, you know, symptoms are important. So 
are things changing over time for you? You know, did you used to be somebody who could run two miles without any issue and you're finding you're getting increasingly shorter breath with it? Are you having any chest pain? Is your heart beating funny? Are you having fast rhythms of your heart? Are you getting dizzy? Are you passing out when you're, when you're doing exercise? Because that's a worry. Um, and then also, are you on any supplements? So, you know, sports are very, very different now for kids than they were when, when I was young. Um, things are more competitive. They're more scientific. And so lots of kids are taking supplements. And sometimes these contain caffeine or taurine or other stimulants. Um, sometimes there's high protein loads, which can affect their kidneys. Uh, and so I want to know those things. And, you know, I, I, I put the cartoon on the left-hand side of the screen emphasizing trust because, you know, I make it very clear that I, I, I trust my patients. I trust them to tell me what's going on with them and to tell their parents what's going on with them. And, you know, I, I think that honestly, that's only, that's only fair because the amount of trust that our patients and our families are putting in us to take care of them um, is tremendous. And so I, I really think that that part of the way that I can show my respect is, is by making that a two-way street, but it does place a degree of responsibility on, on kids and families, to be honest. And then I want to know what's going on with them from a family history perspective. Genetic testing can be very helpful to get a sense of how malignant the disease running in the family is. I don't do a cardiac MRI on any on every patient, but for many, it's helpful to get an objective marker of function, to look at whether there's a scar in the heart, which can be a nidus for arrhythmia. Um, you know, I have the luxury of having a, a really wonderful exercise lab here. Um, and this is a, is a great test, um, you know, because an exercise test really is a way to recreate um, an opportunity for the heart to be at its greatest stress and see what it does at that time. Uh, and so I, I find that tremendously useful and helpful. And then often a period of rhythm monitoring. Um, some kids go home with a patch, some kids even have an implantable rhythm monitor to get a sense of, of what their heart is doing while they're exercising. But I also wanna know more about their exercises. So the location matters for me. If there's a child I know who's had a lot of arrhythmias, then swimming may be a real worry for me because passing out in a pool is a real problem. If they've had a if if they're going for a lot of runs, are they doing that with somebody or are they doing it alone? Because if you're running with somebody, then that means if you're not feeling well, you can tell them, um, and you've got sort of a little bit of a, a safety net. Um, and then different activities have different implications and treat the heart differently. So, you know, I think it's really important that when I when a kid tells me they want to do track, like I want to know, well, are they talking about running a 5,000 or are they running a 100 meter dash? When they say track, are they actually doing a throwing event? Um, because all of these things are going to impact the heart differently and have different risk profiles. And then I think it's really important that kids know as much about their disease as they can in a way that feels safe to them and safe to their family. So, you know, when I have kids who have thick hearts, they should know that being hydrated is really important. And I want them to know that it's important because it helps fill their heart and make sure they can get enough blood flow out to their brain and their body. I want a child to know that they're taking an antiarrhythmic medication because it stops them from having dangerous rhythms of the heart. Because I think being honest with them, with them about that makes them more likely to do it. You know, it's very hard to to do something just because somebody tells you to do it. Often, if you're able to give a reason and explain to them why it's important, I think you're more effective in getting there. And then finally, I really think it's important, again, to come back to what is the ultimate goal and what is acceptable for a child to adapt. So I'll give you another, another example of that. I, I took care of a 12-year-old um, young man who had played very competitive soccer uh, when he was growing up, and soccer was getting to the level of competition based on the arrhythmias that, that he was having where it did not seem like a safe choice for him anymore. And so I said to him, you know, like, um, what are the things that are really important to you about sports? Like, what would you be willing to, to compromise on? And it became clear that like what he really valued was, was the team and spending time with his friends. And as it turned out from years of soccer conditioning um, and the fact that his dad actually had been a, a division one runner, he was in great shape. And so he took up cross country for him, that was a way in which he could continue to spend time with his friends. He got a great deal out of that sport and it didn't feel like a loss to him in the same kind of way. It just felt like a trade of doing something. You know, the next topic I wanna to touch on is shared decision-making. This is something that's been incorporated into a lot of guidelines, mostly for adults. And I wanna to talk to you a little bit about what this means and how we can adapt it to a pediatric context. So in my mind, shared decision-making really has, has three aspects. One is introducing the idea that there is a choice here, right? That 
that what we're talking about is not an absolute, that there's some some room for decision making and that those decisions are probably not the same in every family or with every patient. Two is describing what the options are. So what are the things that are on the table? And then finally, helping patients explore what they're most interested in and then make a decision. Now, another thing I want to emphasize is that the idea of shared decision-making, particularly in the pediatric context, does not absolve me of my role as an expert. So, you know, it has taken me a number of years and a number and number of hours to have a level of understanding of, of, of physiology and anatomy that is really complex and difficult. And even with that amount of training, I still have a hard time with this sometimes. And so I think it's it's really, really unfair to patients and their families to just throw choices on the table and tell them to pick from one. And I don't think that's what shared decision-making means. I think it means giving them your best estimation of what you think the potential risks and benefits are. And I also think it means that if you think that there is something that has unacceptable risk, telling them that that's the case. And I think, again, as part of this idea of honesty, I want to walk through an emergency action plan here. So I try to communicate when I can with schools and coaches, and I think that often helps um, people to feel more comfortable with what we're doing. So if there's a coach who just knows they have a child whose heart is different, but they're playing on the team, they can be very apprehensive. But if I can talk to the coach on the phone and I can say, look, you know, you can run them, you know, their, their legs can be as tired as you like. I'm okay if their legs bother them so much they can't walk tomorrow, but this is a child for whom hydration is really critical. And if they are getting dizzy when they're running, they need to stop. That puts some parameters in place for them to know when to be worried and when not to be worried. You know, I think similarly, I want my families to know if there's an AED available and if so, where it is. And I want coaches and people at schools to know how to use an AED because that's a life-saving device. In all honesty, it more commonly is used in kids without a diagnosis of cardiomyopathy um, or who don't have a diagnosis of cardiomyopathy at that time. But we should all know where those exist. And I can tell you when I go to all of my kids' sporting events, like one of the things I do is I just scan the area to get a sense of if there's something available, where it is um, in case I should need to use it. So this is a slide that um, uh, another cardiologist that I work with, Imran Masood, uh, made that gives a basic overview of our approach uh, to taking care of, of children with cardiomyopathy. So I think, you know, in sum, the idea is doing an individualized risk assessment for all kids, um, making sure that they are educated enough about their heart to know what they should be doing, what they should be worried about, and choosing exercise that matches their preferences and their risk, and then doing the things we can to keep them safe. So exercising with a partner or a teammate, having access to an AED, having trained providers as close by as possible. Um, and I think that overall, this is kind of a, a framework that patients and families have been very, very respect, re receptive to. You know, um, I think during the last few minutes of this, I want to want to segue to talking about cardiac rehabilitation. As I said, I think this is a topic that we don't cover as much in pediatric patients, but is really um, has a tremendous opportunity to to improve outcomes and, and improve quality of life in kids. So cardiac rehab, as some of you may know, is a medically supervised program that's designed to improve cardiovascular health. And this is the standard of care in adult patients. It's most commonly used after an acute event like a myocardial infarction, but not exclusively. So for adults with heart failure, cardiomyopathy, this is frequently used as well. And I, I think it really has three critical components. So one is exercise counseling teaching people how to exercise, what exercise is safe for them, educating them about general heart healthy choices. So foods to eat, uh, you know, in adults, it's often quitting smoking. Fortunately, that's not an issue for our kids. But then also there's the, the counseling component of this. So supporting them to meet their goals. And that's something that we, I think, haven't done as well as we could with pediatric patients. But what do we know about cardiac rehab in kids? Well, generally things have gone very well. So children with dilated cardiomyopathy, when they undergo cardiac rehab, their six-minute walk distances improve. Their waist circumferences decrease, and they haven't had adverse events. Kids with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, their exercise capacity also gets better. And again, no episodes of arrhythmia. Again, I, you know, I, I have the luxury of working with a really world-class team um, in our exercise lab, and that means that we've been able to do cardiac rehab even on children who have continuous infusions of medication running through IVs. Um, and even those kids who are among the sickest of the sick, 
haven't had any issues doing cardiac rehab with hypotension or arrhythmia. They haven't dislodged the PICC line that's running their medications. And then as some of you may know, children with, with refractory advanced heart failure wind up with ventricular assist devices. And those are kids who we also do cardiac rehab on actually pretty vigorously to, to recondition them. And they do great. We haven't had adverse events with them. They haven't had hypotension. They haven't had arrhythmias or any trouble with their VADs. So I think, you know, in summary, cardiac rehabilitation, it's definitely safe. It definitely can be done. And it does seem to improve cardiovascular health. Yet despite those three factors, it is not standard of care in our children. And that's a problem. And I think it's not standard of care for a number of reasons. So people are still worried about safety. There's a lack of expertise. So there are far fewer pediatric practitioners who are trained in exercise physiology than there are adults. And then also this is a resource intensive thing often. It's resource intensive for the hospital, right? So I have exercise physiologists in an exercise lab, but it's also really a big burden on the family, right? So asking any family to get a kid to come into the hospital three or four times a week to work out is hard. And what I found is that the kids who are able to, to do cardiac rehab are often those who are from families that have more resources. Um, and in my mind, this is a major problem because it means that we're delivering inequitable care, right? A child should not receive different care based on their tax bracket or where they live. You know, just by virtue of being close to CHOP as opposed to another hospital that doesn't have the resources that we do, shouldn't mean that that child who lives farther away gets, gets worse care. And so with this in mind, it started to brainstorm some ways that we can deliver cardiac rehabilitation to larger groups of patients um, and do so in a more equitable way. And I think really one of the ways to do that is by, by leveraging virtual technology. So this was a pilot program that we did in transplant patients and we're gonna be unrolling uh, um, uh, cardiomyopathy patients in as well, uh, sort of a similar analogous program. Um, but the idea is, you know, COVID was terrible in a number of ways, but one of the things that it really did was it highlighted how effective using virtual technology could be. And so this is a, a collaborative study that includes cardiologists, psychologists, and exercise physiologists um, to complete cardiac rehabilitation in, um, this is a group of transplant patients, but again, moving on to cardiomyopathy patients. So they participate in a longitudinal group aerobic training program. So they meet virtually, they see each other on a Zoom screen just like this. And after school, they do a 30 minute workout. Um, with an exercise physiologist trained in the care of children with cardiomyopathy. Over time, they accumulate rewards badges, and that's what you can see on the right. And, you know, I think this idea, I, I know for me, right, like if I haven't worked out all week and I know that I'm going to lose my Peloton streak, it kind of pushes me to get back on the treadmill and make sure that I, I earn that. And gamification works for kids too. So we've got to harness that and to encourage our kids to work. I think the other thing that's different about this is that, you know, this is a study that has the component of, um, of psychosocial support as well. So we have psychologists who meet with our kids to talk about what are the things that are motivating them to exercise and what are the things that are, are causing them to lag behind. Um, I think this is a really promising area. I think, you know, the other thing that I wanted to highlight that, that we're doing uh, here, which has been I think a wonderful experience has been a dedicated sports cardiology clinic. So, you know, this is an outpatient consult service. The idea is not to take the place of the primary cardiologist. Rather, we see kids who have primary cardiologists, but who are either athletes or interested in being more active. And the entire purpose of the visit is to meet with, with me or another of the sports cardiologists, an exercise physiologist, a nutritionist, and really just focus on activity understanding what are the things that you can do, how to do them, and then to follow up. And frequently, honestly, these follow-up appointments are virtual and they're with an exercise physiologist who checks in. How is that new program we going started? Anything that we can do to adapt? Um, I got to say that this, you know, of, of all the clinics that I get to do, this, this happens to be one of my favorites. It's interesting. It's innovative. The kids and families that I get to take care of here are just um, so motivated um, and trying to find a way to get involved and be more active. Now, I, you know, I acknowledge that there are going to be many places in which you don't have a sports cardiology clinic, or you don't even have an option for a virtual exercise rehabilitation program, although I'm hoping that that will, will come out for many more children in the near future. But what can you do right now? So one is you can talk to your cardiologist. 
You can tell them that being active is important to you and you want to talk about how to do that safely. I think developing your own goals and anticipation of that is important. And then ask your cardiologist, what are you worried about? What are the things that you see as risks? I think you can also ask whether there's support available. The answer may be no, but it may be yes too. And finally, I think one thing that I would urge you to do is, you know, if this is something that's on your list, send a note to the cardiologist about this prior to coming to the appointment. And I bring that up because I think for many cardiologists, this concept and this topic is going to cause some stress and some consternation. And many of them may want to have the opportunity to think about it beforehand or to reach out to colleagues. And so, you know, understanding the heterogeneity and providers that we've seen, I think giving your cardiologist an opportunity to think this over before you come in is um, more likely to result in a, a positive conversation. All right, so what are the big take-home points that I have? I think exercise is safe for many patients with cardiomyopathy, and it's helpful from both a cardiovascular and mental health standpoint. Our field is changing and improving. Um, Patient-specific risk is important. It's important for us to understand it, but it's also important for our patients to understand what their risk is. Cardio rehab is safe, it's effective, and ultimately virtual technology is a way that we can increase access and give more equitable care. Finally, you know, I go back to that point about um, autonomy and control, that exercise and activity is a way that our kids can really help to, to determine their ultimate outcome. Um, and I think that that's a really wonderful thing and something that I, I think is a real privilege to get to be a part of. So, you know, in the interest of giving folks time and opportunity to ask questions, I, I wanna close here. Um, I've included my email uh, in case there are things that we don't get to, uh, and then a, a, a phone number if you wanna hear more about the sports cardiology clinic or anything else that we're doing. All right. Thank you so much. Great, thank you, Dr. Edelson. That was great, um, very informative. Um, so we're going to open the Q and A session now. Um, we we've already got some questions submitted. Um, so yes, in in case we don't get to yours, we will definitely connect um, with Dr. Edelson offline to make sure that you get comments on anything that was submitted that we don't have time for. Um, just a reminder, questions uh, should general should be in a, of a general nature um, and, uh, and are not uh, seen as providing any medical advice specifically. Um, so at this time, um, uh, let's start with the first question. Um, are you able to talk more specifically about any considerations for restrictive cardiomyopathy and sports participation? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, yeah, I apologize for not going far into restrictive cardiomyopathy. So, you know, I think um, a lot of restrictive cardiomyopathy and restriction is going to be based on symptom management um, and the level of both diastolic dysfunction um, that exists. So, you know, the, the times in which I'd be particularly worried about exercise in children with restrictive cardiomyopathy are if they're having... Um, any episodes of lightheadedness or dyspnea um, that's out of proportion when they're exercising, or if they have um, a, a significant burden of arrhythmia. You know, I, I found that in general, kids who have um, restrictive physiology, whether it's in isolation or in conjunction with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, often limit themselves. Um, they tend not to be kids who, who push past what they're able to do. Um, so, you know, I think that that tends to be where I stand with them. Again, that's a patient population for whom an exercise test is tremendously helpful to get a sense of what their heart really does when we push it. Great, thank you. Kind of along the, the same line, um, is there any indication or correlation with a patient who has um, non-compaction cardiomyopathy or also in combination with DCM or HCM? Mm -hmm. You know, yeah, non-compaction is interesting. It's it's such a um, such a wide array of things. So, you know, I I think that in my mind, if a child has um, non-compaction but preserved function, um, then uh, there's very little restriction that I would offer, unless there's something else concerning that I would find. Otherwise, the way I would handle restriction in somebody with non-compaction um, really falls in line with uh, the potential issues that I might see with another cardiomyopathy. So if you have non-compaction and your ejection fraction is severely depressed, then we probably need to stay away from highly competitive sports. 
um, just like you would with somebody with dilated cardiomyopathy. If you have non-compaction and you have a lot of arrhythmia, then you need to control the arrhythmia before doing something that could precipitate it. Um, but generally, you know, non-compaction with preserved function um, is something that that um, we may actually ultimately decide is just a normal variant. Okay, thank you. During the 16-week exercise experiment you mentioned, did you monitor perceived rate of exertion or heart rate based? Uh, we did heart rate based um, as opposed to perceived rate of exertion. You know, I think there there's utility in doing both of those, um, and I think there was there's also a little bit um, of, uh, I guess, informal monitoring your perceived rate of exertion because it was a, you know, like um a little bit of a, of a, of a check-in with our, um, with our physiologist who was saying, you know, this should be sort of moderate intensity. We're not asking you to go all out here. You shouldn't be at the point where you're totally breathless. You should be at the point where you're working, but still able to have some level of interaction and conversation, but we didn't have kids chart, uh, their, their, their perceived rate of exertion. Thank you. Is cardiac rehabilitation generally covered through insurance or is that an out of pocket type of expense? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, this comes up a lot. Um, it's it's very dependent on your own insurance, unfortunately. Um, we, we often can find ways working with the financial counselor to make sure that um that it can that it is is not um an undue burden on the family. Um, and, you know, again, I think fortunately we, we, we are lucky to have the resources that we have, but it, it means that if, um, if the video visit with the exercise physiologist to, to check in and see how your rehab session is going, if that isn't covered, then maybe something that, that can take place regardless. Um, okay. thank you. Um, another question is, would you add monitoring for symptoms to, to the monitoring for symptoms, um, counseling about vaping and CBD product use? Surprisingly, more are using than expected. Yeah, no, I agree. A ton of kids are, are vaping and using, you know, you know, I think as, um, as cannabinoids have become legalized in a number of states, that's become certainly an, an increasing issue. Um, you know, I think that that's sort of like a, um, critical aspect of, of healthy lifestyle in general, as opposed to particularly in conjunction with sports themselves. Um, you know, I, I will say that in general, we know that kids who participate in organized sports are less likely to, to, to use excessive amounts of illicit substances, um, probably for any number of reasons. Um, but that is something that I certainly check in with, with my patients on. Um, and it's worth noting that for, for certain medications, they interact with marijuana. Um, and so uh, it's worth knowing just whether, whether that's part of their habit, knowing whether your medications are working properly. Thank you. How does um, the presence of an ICD in a child um, impact their participation um, guidelines and su suggested participation? Yep. So, yeah, so lots of kids have ICDs in place either because they had an event or because we know they're at increased risk for events. Um, I would say one piece that's different when you think about sports participation is that, you know, with an, with an ICD, you have to worry about not just risk to the heart, but risk to the device. So, you know, um, you know, depends where, what kind of device that you have, but, you know, you, you wouldn't want to do something where the device itself could get hit. Um, and you could have direct stress trauma, or you have to worry potentially about lead malfunction um, with the device itself. Um, otherwise, I think, you know, we do sort of acknowledge that there's an, an increased level of protection that exists um, for arrhythmia. The child has an ICD in place. At the same time, we also know that they are not 100% effective. And if a child is, you know, um, built up a lot of acid, um, they may not just from exercising, they may not work quite as well. So, you know, if I know that a child has got an increased risk for having an abnormal rhythm in their heart, um, and they've got an ICD put in place, do I, I probably feel a little bit better about letting them play. But if I know a kid is still having lots of abnormal rhythms, um, 
then I probably wouldn't encourage them to play until we get the rhythms under better control first. I think the other piece that I always talk to kids about actually with an ICD is that, you know, ICDs can, can inadvertently shock. And so when you're, when you're exercising with an ICD in place, when your heart rate gets very high, just from doing your job and running around, you, you know, that can put you at, at risk for an inadvertent shock. Um, and so it's important to be aware of that, to talk with the EP team about how to sort of maximize things. Thank you. Another question is, can you comment on um, roller coasters and uh, if that is something that is considered a safe activity for cardiomyopathy patients? Yeah, in general, I've let kids go on roller coasters. Um, you know, the, 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 the populations that I have restricted roller coasters in is like immediately post-surgery, obviously. Um, kids who have uh, VADs in place. So with a VAD, you have an external power source and I worry about it falling out of the roller coaster. That could be a real issue. Um, if I know a kid in addition to a cardiomyopathy has got a um, catecholamine driven abnormal rhythm process um, like CPVT, then you would consider restricting. But for most kids, roller coasters is not something I scratch off the list because of cardiomyopathy, to be honest. Okay, thank you. Another question is, um, can youth, uh, as they enter puberty, is there, how does that impact um, recommendations or participation? Great question. Um, I think in several ways. So one is, you know, um, there's sort of a lot of intersection of things going on then, right? So, you know, just as like the body changes more during puberty, the heart changes more rapidly during puberty. So we do increase surveillance during that period of time. Sports are also becoming more competitive at that point. So, you know, the, the, like, there are very few things that um, an eight-year-old does that I would restrict them from doing. A 16-year-old, um, there are some things that are going to be more demanding and more competitive and that we have to talk about. Um, and so I think due to the competition of increasing competition and then sort of increasing changes, um, adolescence tends to be a time where I'd I do more monitoring. I see kids more frequently. I'm more likely to repeat exercise tests. I'm more likely to repeat rhythm monitoring just to make sure that we all feel safe about where we are. And then the other piece that I think can be tricky, right, is I, I brought up this idea of shared decision-making, but um, sometimes uh, the adolescent's take on things is not the same as the parent's take on things. Um, and helping to negotiate that, I think, takes some nuance and dexterity. Great, thank you. Um, another question is, can you talk a bit about um, what is, are sometimes referred to as burst activities and what that, you know, as far as um, basketball or soccer, um, where there's rapid running and stopping and, and what that looks like as far as cardiomyopathy patient mm -hmm. participation? Great question. Yeah, so, you know, the idea of, right, a uh, a burst activity is where you're going to um, go from zero to 60 very, very quickly. Um, I think that, you know, um, there are a few things that I think about taking place in burst activities that I'd consider for an athlete. Um, so generally for children with a, a dilated uh, phenotype, burst activities aren't going to be a particularly big issue. Um, I think the, the question is when you have somebody with, with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, um, and is this a case where their heart rate is becoming so fast, so quickly that the heart is beating so fast that it's not filling appropriately and becomes increasingly obstructed? Um, um, and, you know, I think that to that end, sometimes those are kids who need to be on beta blockers to make sure that the heart doesn't ever get too fast. Um, similarly, I think that, you know, that can be a situation if we have a kid who wants to play basketball or soccer for whom, in addition to an exercise test, we can, we can do a stress echocardiogram to take a look at, at what their heart is looking when they're sort of going from zero to 60 very quickly. So is this a heart that looks like it is so thick that it's not filling adequately at higher heart rates? Um, so I think about that sort of dynamic obstructive component. And then certainly we know that some kids are more likely to have rhythm disturbances um, when they go sort of very very quickly from zero to 60, but that's another thing that we can, can evaluate and see whether a kid is at risk for. Great, thank you. 
Um, another question is um, around a child participating in what's considered recreational sports teams versus like the travel and the more intensive kind of considerations. Um, can, do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I was thinking about this actually just before we started presenting, you know, because the, you know, the, the truth is there is so much heterogeneity. Um, so, you know, um, I think it's really important as a, as a physician to take the time and understand what I, I like to ask, not just are you playing travel soccer or rec league soccer, but tell me what your practices look like. So tell me how many hours a week are you practicing and what are you doing in practice? Because even in, you know, so I'm in Philadelphia and um, youth soccer is a, a big deal here. And so like, even within travel soccer for like early teens, the difference is tremendous. Um, and similarly, like, you know, folks who are going to play high school football in Texas, that's a very different thing than playing high school football where I grew up in Brooklyn, New York. Um, and so I, I honestly, I, I don't use those those grades as much as I use um, a better sense of what it is that they're doing, how much demand they're really putting on things. Great, thank you so much. Well, we are just about at time. So I wanted to, um, to close us out and thank you again, Dr. Edelson for all of your time and expertise with our group today. Oh yeah, no, honestly, these are great questions. This is a very, um, very well-informed, very, very, very smart group. Um, I appreciate everybody taking the time. I know there are a million things you could be doing. Uh, please feel free to, to follow up with Gina or with me directly with other questions, um, or if you have ideas how I can make this helpful um, when we do something similar in the future. Great, thank you so much. Um, and thank you all to all of our attendees for your time and participation today. Um, Please do uh, watch for the webinar recording um, on our website in the coming days. And in the meantime, stay, stay in touch uh, with us. Feel welcome to reach out via email or on social uh, media. Um, we do have a couple more webinars that are in the works for the rest of the year. So be sure to check out our calendar um, on our website for, for those upcoming sessions as well. And in the meantime, I wish you all a great afternoon. Thanks again for coming. Take care, everybody.